We pray this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for bringing us now to your house where we can come collectively with one heart and one mind to praise you and to worship you. Be with us now as we worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
good morning to you. You can be seated, and I want to welcome you here today to the service of Plain Edge Church. And to those of you that are watching us live online, thank you too for joining with this service. And I hope it will be an encouragement to you and a blessing as we continue to seek God's Word and find out what He has for the Christian life. Boy, it's a wonderful, beautiful day outside on the Lord's Day. Amen? The sun is shining. It's great. This looks like a pretty good audience. Okay, well, I would have said good, but I want to see what pretty good would do. But anyway, thank you so much for being a part of today's service. And uh, this is a very special time, always in God's house on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. Well, if you've been following along the last couple of weeks, then you know that I have been in a series entitled Salvation. For the last several weeks, I've been talking about salvation and how it affects us all, and I've given several illustrations from the Bible about people who encountered the possibility of being saved, even personal encounters with Christ, and yet uh, many of them walked away. A few weeks ago, we talked about the man who had everything. It was the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible, and he was rich, he was a ruler, Uh, He was highly educated, he had many things, he had a great audience, and yet when confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, he really walked away. He didn't take time to accept Christ as his message was, the man who had everything, but he lacked eternal life in Jesus Christ. And then we talked about the man who wanted to wait. The man who wanted to wait was Felix. Felix was the Roman governor of Judea, and uh, he had summoned Paul uh, when Paul was a prisoner, And he said, "Uh, let me hear the things concerning Christ. He initially was interested, and he called Paul in. But after Paul gave him the gospel and what it was really all about, the Bible tells us that Felix said, go away now, Paul. Go away. Leave me alone. When I have a convenient season or another time, I I may call upon you then. As far as we know, he never really called on him again for the gospel of Christ. And then we talked about an illustration from the Old Testament. Remember when Sodom was destroyed, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, uh, uh, God destroyed the city of Sodom because of their wickedness and their violence. And uh, Lot's wife, Lot was saved and some of his family members were saved, but Lot's wife, the Bible tells us, turned back towards Sodom when God said, don't look back when you escape. The Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt. And in the New Testament, There's a statement in the Bible in the Gospel of Luke that said, remembers Lot's wife. So we're called upon to remember how Lot's wife was close to being saved, and yet she turned back away from God, and she lost her life when Sodom was also destroyed. Then last week, we talked about the high cost of sin and how that sin wrecks havoc in people's lives. And the Bible has so much to say about it. But we exposed what sin was, and that's really why Jesus died on the cross. His death, His burial, His resurrection was all a result of sin. And uh, he uh, He was killed on the cross. He gave Himself. He shed His blood. Fortunately for us, He rose from the grave, and that sealed our redemption in Christ to overcome sin. Well, today we're going to address the Christian audience, people who have claimed Christ as their Savior. You're not like the rich young ruler that walked away. You're not uh, someone who's wanting to wait and and maybe decide at a later date. Uh, You haven't turned back away from God like Lot's wife. And you're really someone who has embraced Christ. You have come to faith in Christ. You believe Him as Savior and as Lord. And so today, we're going to address Uh, the subject of working out salvation. You know, in order to be productive in life, you have to work. And I salute you for that. I know we have many hard workers in the church. Sometimes people take two, even three jobs to make ends meet. And our nation even applauds workers on Labor Day every year. We honor the labor force of America. And so you've heard the old expression, anything worth having is worth working for. And I think that's true in life. It's true as we go through life, we teach our children the same, they get an education, they enter the workforce, and they uh, become productive in society. And so we honor labor and work. And really, you know, without doing work, uh, things just don't happen. Things just don't get done. Well, it's always been true in the physical world. But do you know that working also applies in the spiritual world? 
And we're going to talk about that this morning because that's what the Bible commands us to do. It says to work out our salvation, to work it out. And I'm going to explain to you shortly what that exactly means. But Paul is addressing a Christian audience in the book of Philippians, the church at Philippi, when he uh, states these remarks. So let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, first of all today, where the apostle Paul wrote these words, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, and then notice these words, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. So just as we get up on Monday morning, at least in most cases, and go to work and work through Friday, that's kind of the average. We do that in the physical world. That's the norm. And so for the Christian, the norm is working out your own salvation. And the Bible adds these words with fear and trembling, which I think emphasizes the awesome responsibility and the necessity to understand the significance of doing that. Um, and so a Christian, let me explain what that means to work out your own salvation. I don't want you to misunderstand. This is a very, very significant part of today's message. A Christian does not work to get saved. You do not work to get saved. Saved. In fact, you can never accomplish salvation by works. The Bible says, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. So a Christian does not work to get saved. Also, a Christian does not work to stay saved. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, their own human achievement and effort can accomplish for them what they want eternally? No. A Christian does not work to get saved nor to stay saved. A Christian works because they are saved. Because I'm a Christian, I do the work of God. Because I have been redeemed by His blood and have given eternal salvation has been given to me, I work for His kingdom. So not to get saved, not to stay saved, but because I am saved saved. And Matthew explains it this way, let your light shine before God and before the world that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So by working for God's word and God's kingdom, I am a light to the world around me and they can see the glory of God through that. And it is also confirmed in the book of James where James says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So works are significant, but not to get saved, and not to stay saved, but because you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So when the scripture says, work out your own salvation, it's not saying anything that you do gives you salvation. It's not saying that anything that you accomplish is what gives you salvation. It's just saying God gave it to you by your trust and belief in Him, by your faith in Him. Now work it out to others, outwardly to the world around you, so they will see and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let's talk about that here for a couple of minutes today. Work out your salvation. What does that mean? It means work out your obedience. It means to work out your obedience. In the very next verse, in, cha in chapter 2 of Philippians, verse 13, we read these words. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. In the life of every Christian, God is working in you and in me and working through you and working through me. And so it's actually saying here that he has a will for my life. He has a will for your life. He has a good pleasure for my life. He has a good pleasure for your life. So I am to obey the stirrings of God in my heart. As God stirs my heart, as God leads me through his commandments, as God tells me from his word what I should be doing or maybe what I should not be doing, that's his will. That's his good pleasure. 
and I am to reply with obedience. The New Testament says on a couple occasions this, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's obedience. What parent here doesn't know that uh, that works well with your child, right? Wrong? Okay. I think you're wrong, but, you know, obedience works well with a child. And uh, when I was growing up, I had great parents. I love my parents. My father's gone today. My mother's still living. Just celebrated her 89th birthday. And uh, they taught I was one of four boys. And they taught all of us obedience. And you know what? When we were, things were smooth. When we weren't, well, you fill in the blank, okay? It wasn't quite so smooth. Obedience makes things orderly. Obedience gives structure. Obedience has respect. And you know, for a Christian, God says, respect me. Revere me. I am God and you are not, Rob. So obey me. If you love me, Rob, keep my commandments. And that's his will. And that's his good pleasure. And so uh, it's very clear in the scriptures and the importance of that. So God stirs me to do something. What is he stirring you to do? I think a better question for all of us, including myself, would be, am I doing it? God may be stirring, but am I doing it? What is God asking me to do? What is God calling me to do? What is God expecting me to do? And you know what? What am I doing? Am I doing? What am I doing about it? Am I doing it? I think that's important because sometimes people look at God as though, you know, He gives instructions, then I'll go along my way. You know, God expects, but, you know, I'll choose what I want to do and I'll walk away. You know, but true obedience is not like that. I heard a definition many, many years ago. It was a good definition. There are many definitions. But obedience is doing exactly what you're told to do when you're told to do it. And here's the kicker, with the right attitude. Exactly what you're told to do when you're told to do it. A simple illustration would be you tell one of your children to take out the trash. Well, they don't even take out the trash. So they didn't do what they were told to do. It's also when you're told to do it. You tell them to take out the trash today, and so they take out the trash three days from today, you know, (laughs) and it piles over the top. That's not real obedience. And then also with the right attitude. Okay, they grab the can, they go outside, they dump it in, they huff, they puff, they come in, they slam the door. Not a very good attitude, would you say? Obedience is doing what you're told when you're told to do it with the right attitude. And so God's Scripture tells me what to do, when to do it, and I should have a good attitude about it. And that is real obedience. That is true obedience. That is working out obedience. Let's look at another statement from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. The Bible says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't push away the Holy Spirit. That's what it means not to grieve Him. Do not reject the Holy Spirit. So, you know, a lot of times God stirs me and He stirs you. We push Him away. We reject Him. A lot of times God tells me what I should be doing or what I should stop doing in some situations, and I push Him away or you push Him away. And that's not obedience at all. And I'm not working out the salvation that God gave me. I'm not demonstrating to the world around me what God has done for me and how God is good to me. I'm just acting like everyone else who doesn't even claim to believe in Christ. And so Christ should make an impact in my life. It should be worked out through my life. And when God calls with His will and His good pleasure, you know, I'm ready to go. And I'm willing to go at that exact time. Uh, Here's another way to look at it. Work out not being, and this is one that I I know no one is guilty of. I'm going to state that up front. No one in the room is guilty of, okay? Work out not being a complainer. And I already said no one's guilty of that, right? No one here ever complains about anything, right? (laughs) Well, that's kind of rhetorical. You know what I'm saying. But the Bible says that. Philippians 2.14, let's read on, very next verse. Do all things without complaining and disputing. If I'm going to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, I have to obey God's word and God's will. 
and God's good pleasure in my life. And also, I'm to do all things without complaining and disputing. No complaining, no disputing. And I tell you, you're wonderful. I, I just have never heard it around here. I mean, just nobody ever complains, nobody ever disputes. I've never done. No, you know that's not true. But that's the goal. That's what God expects. And if I work that out, not complaining, not disputing, if I work that out in my daily life, that says tons to the people around me about who I am. Not that I'm something so big, but they have questions now. And I can tell them about the gospel of Christ and that Jesus saves and that He changed my life. And, and it becomes evident to them because I walk a little differently than most people walk. I act a little differently than most people act. I talk a little differently than most people talk. But you know what? If I fall in the same old humdrum, the same old rut, I'm no different. It doesn't bring any glory to God. All right. What is complaining? What is complaining? Well, you've probably got a pretty good definition of your own. But let me just give you a couple of thoughts on it. Complaining is criticism. Criticism. And, of course, I'm talking about unjust criticism, unjustifiable criticism, the kind of criticism that just breaks down and tears down and is destructive. Criticism is complaining. Dissatisfaction. We just touched this a little bit in our ABF class this morning. I'm in... Rick's class with a number of people here in the church, and he, he did a great job. We had a great class this morning, and I want to go over the class because I know that many of you after this service will be going to ABF classes, and you'll be studying the lesson on your own. But we just touched on it briefly. It wasn't really even the heart of the lesson, but we did touch on it just briefly about this idea of satisfaction. You know, in America, we're satisfied, and you know, that, that doesn't mean you have everything you want doesn't mean that you have everything you desire, but we are clearly satisfied in America. We have so much freedom. We have so much opportunity. We have so many things. We have so much money. We have things that the rest of the world would not even ever dream of having. And yet, and I'm not saying this is necessarily true of you, maybe it's not, but and yet, some people are so dissatisfied. They're just so dissatisfied. Because they look at somebody else. You know, there's always going to be someone who has something you don't have. There's always going to be someone that has more than I have. So we, rather than look at God and His blessings and how the abundance of things appear in our life, we look at the one who has a little bit more and we become dissatisfied. We look at the person that has the one thing that we would like to have and we don't have it and we become dissatisfied. And you know what? That's criticism. It's criticism. When I am so dissatisfied for what you have, or for what someone else has, and what I don't have, and what God hasn't given to me, and I become dissatisfied because of that. That is criticism to the nth degree. And Paul warns us about that. And he says, if you're going to have the mind of Christ, if you're going to follow the path of Christ, if you're going to work out the salvation of Christ to the world around you, you can't walk around being dissatisfied all the time. And you know what? We as Americans have plenty. Oh, we don't always have what we want, but God said He'll supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory, and so we should not be dissatisfied, and that's complaining. Here's something else that complaining does. It finds fault, fault finding. People who are critical, people who are complaining are always finding fault with everyone around them. I don't have any faults, but you have fault. You have faults. I'm pointing at people. Now, that's a bad thing. I, I try not to point at people. I'm only pointing at my friends, okay? <laughs> only at my friends. I never point at the online audience. I won't point at you. But there's nothing wrong with me. I just find fault in you and you and you and really you. you know? <laughs> and that's what complaining does. It complains about everyone around you everyone around me, but never really thinking anything about my life or my situation. Well, you know what? I'm not going to work out God's salvation when that's what I show to people, that they're all wrong. I'm right about everything. They're all off base, but I'm on base. No, that continual fault finding. And you know what? We've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. I think if we're honest, we've done it at times. But, but many Christians are able to overcome that through the power and the strength of Christ in their life. But sometimes... 
Christians fall into a trap where they're just doing that all the time. And it's regular. It's routine in their life. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen in your life. All right, what is disputing? It's, it's slightly different. There's some overlap, but a little bit different. Do all things without complaining or disputing to work out salvation. So here is what disputing is, arguing. Now, I don't expect you to raise your hands. This is not one of those times I want everybody to throw their hand up, okay? But are you argumentative? <laughs> Are you arguing? And I mean in the negative way. I'm not, you know, there are times to, for an argument, I suppose, in a broad sense, in a right way. But I'm talking about someone who just argue, argue, argues all the time about everything to everyone. Are you one of those kind of people? I hope not. I don't want to be. I'm sure you don't want to be. But, but I've been around people, and you've been around people that just argue all the time. They have an opinion about everything all the time. And they argue, 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 and it just gets old. And you know what? It's one thing as a Christian, when I'm in a situation where there's a lot of argumentation, okay, I've been a Christian a long time. I'm not perfect, but I'm mature enough to know, you know what, I can still walk away. But as a Christian, if I'm argumentative to those who are non-Christians, that sends the wrong message. It sends the entire wrong message of what Jesus is all about, the Bible is all about, what Christianity is all about. They're just going to walk off and say, you know, Rob, that guy argues all the time. I mean, he gets in a fight all the time. He's upset about everything. You know what? That's not going to send the message of the love of God to anyone. So be careful about arguing all the time. We've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. I mean, we have. But be careful about falling into the temptation of just always arguing your point or always arguing the, 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 the subject or always getting in contention with people. You know what? That doesn't send the message of God's love and salvation. It doesn't send it if I do it. It doesn't send it if you do it. All right, disputing is debating. It kind of goes along with what I've talked about already, but always debating a situation. And, and of course, that's how arguments start. But, but, you know, it's one thing to have an opinion. I heard this when I was a kid. Everyone has an opinion. It's like a nose. <laughs> we all have one. And it's all right to have that opinion. I have opinions too. There's nothing wrong with having an opinion about something. But where it is wrong is when I'm always debating my opinion to your opinion and your opinion and their opinion, and my opinion is always superior and always the always. You know, that, that's where I mean by debating, debating, debating. Not expressing yourself. We, we should do that. Free speech, we should do that. I mean, we, we have an option and an opportunity and to do that, and, and that's healthy. But just to always debate. Somebody says right, you say left. Somebody says up, you say down. <laughs> Somebody says good, you say bad. <laughs> and you're just always debating every issue all the time. And you know what? Don't fall into that trap. Because what that does, it sends the wrong message or it doesn't send any message to people who may need Christ as their Savior. Opposing. And again, there's overlap in all of these areas. But these are just different ways to express what is disputing. Opposing. And that kind of goes along with what I've been saying here. How that we oppose, we oppose, we oppose. And uh, we're known more for what we're opposed to than what we're for. Don't be known as the guy, the person who's always opposed. You know what? Whenever I talk to Rob, he's always against it. He's always opposed to it. He never thinks it's a good idea. He, he always says something to say that's negative. I mean, he just always talks it down. I don't want to be the kind of person that when people hear me or are around me that say, you know what? Rob's always telling me what he's against. He's always telling me what he doesn't like. He's always telling me what's wrong. But he, he never really tells me anything good. He never tells me anything to stand for, anything that would be right. You know what? And I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. None of us are. But we all have to guard against that, especially if you're a Christian, that we don't fall into that trap of just always opposing things one after another. Uh, those are the sins, complaining and disputing, 
that brought Israel down in judgment. I'm going to show you a scripture here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me just set the tone. The Bible is talking about, Paul is giving a history lesson of the nation of Israel. They were brought out of bondage in Egypt. Moses led them out. They were rejoicing. God was feeding them physically. He was supplying their needs. And yet, Paul said, God was not pleased with most of the people in Israel. He was not pleased at all with most of the people in Israel. And here's the reason why. He said they're following idols. They're all idolaters. They're idolaters. And he also said they're guilty of sexual immorality. The crowd is wild. They become sexual animals, and it's out of control, and God is not pleased with that. They have tempted God. They have tempted Christ in every one of their daily activities. And the last thing he said about the nation of Israel in the wilderness was, and they complain, they complain, they complain. It wasn't very happy. And that's why they were brought down. Now, they made it to the promised land, but they, they went 40 years in the wilderness without getting there. And God judged them very harshly. Complaining undermines salvation. It divides and it elevates self. Think about it. If I'm a great complainer, I'm going to divide myself from others and really kind of exalt myself because I'm complaining about you. And you know what? That does not work out. Salvation. It elevates Rob. It doesn't talk about the grace and the gift of God. It talks about me and who I am. All right, here's one last thought. Work out a solid testimony. Work out a solid testimony for Christ. And the very next verse is Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Folks, it's a pretty rough world out there right now. There are a lot of negative things going on. There are a lot of things happening. We've got a lot of problems. And uh, I can't solve them all. You can't solve them all. But it just illustrates this point that a lot of the world is crooked and perverse. And the Bible tells the Christian to shine as a light in the middle of all that. Be a light that lights up the darkness, not be someone who turns out the light. Work out that salvation. And there are three thoughts here. I'll take them one at a time, but look at them in this verse. Become blameless, become harmless, and become without fault. All right, let's look at those. What does it mean to be blameless? It means to live above reproach. It means to be a man or a woman of integrity. Blameless does not mean sinless. No one is sinless. I'm not sinless. You're not sinless. No one in the world is sinless. So it's not saying be sinless. We're sinful. That's why Jesus died for us. But when it says blameless, it means that I'm above reproach. I have character and integrity. And I have not got a scandalous life. You hear about scandals all the time and how it brings men and women down. A Christian should be scandal-free pretty much in their life. And that's what it means to be blameless. You cannot be accused of anything substantial. Now, people can accuse me of things because I'm a sinner. They can accuse you of things. But that's different than being able to accuse you or me of substantial scandalous activity in our life. So to be blameless is not to be that. All right, here's another one, harmless. Harmless is a life that's not polluted. It's more about what's good and pure and innocent than about what's evil. A life that's harmless is basically a life that's not without sin but innocent toward real evil. It doesn't overburden or overweigh. And then this last one, without fault. The image here is of an Old Testament sacrifice that's under God's scrutiny. You remember in the Old Testament they had to sacrifice lambs? And what kind of lambs? 
without spot or blemish. God scrutinized that sacrifice. He didn't want just any old lamb. He didn't want the lowest of the lambs. He didn't want the sickest of the lambs. He wanted the best and the brightest without any spot or blemish. And that's what without fault means. Kind of falls under that heading. My life, your life as a Christian should be pretty much focused on good and innocent of evil. And then work out witnessing, the last thought. Work out witnessing. That's telling others about Jesus. The very next verse, verse number 16. Holding fast the word of life. The word of life is the Bible. We're to hold it fast. Everything we put on the screen here comes right out of the Bible. These are all scripture verses right out of the scriptures. We just put them up here, easy reading. You can get them fast, write them down. But they're word for word right out of the scriptures. Because this is the word of life. All right, work it out. You don't work to get saved. You don't work to stay saved. You work because you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. So let me ask you just a quick question. Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Would you say, Rob, I'm a true believer. I am a Christian. And I know it's not because of me. It's not anything that I have done. But according to His mercy, He saved me. I put my faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Hey, I can't save you. This church can't save you. There isn't any church that can save you anywhere. The only one that can save you is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And if He has done that for you, work it out. Show others what He's done. Live so others can see. Act like others can see the difference that He has made in your life. That's the message for everyone in this room. Everyone in this room. If you do not know Jesus as a Savior, if you have not received Him, you can receive Him this morning. It has to be something that you do between you and God in your heart. But all you have to do is pray a simple prayer and say, Dear Jesus, save me. I know that you are God. I can't save myself. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. In Jesus' name. And anyone who does that believing and genuine, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you stand to your feet, please? We're going to sing a closing song like we always do. Just to kind of firm up the message, maybe, you know what? You don't have to remember everything when you come to church. No one does. Not everything. But there should be at least one or two or three little things that maybe it's a scripture or maybe it was something that I said or maybe something God brought to your mind that I didn't say at all. But when you leave the church, you should leave with something. And the overall theme is work out your salvation with fear and trembling or work it out responsibly. Work it out with reverence. Work it out with integrity. Work it out with understanding that it's significant. And with that overall theme, how did God stir your heart this morning? In what way did He stir your heart? What did He stir you to do? He probably stirred all of us to do slightly differently in one way or another with specifics. But He stirred us all to follow His Word and His way. So answer that question as we sing. What is God stirring me to do? And then follow through and do whatever that stirring is. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. 
Thank you for coming to today's service and uh, work out your salvation. And uh, that's a message for me. I need to work out my salvation.